millions of years is everywhere. It's all the documentaries. It's in the museums. It's in the books. It's in the libraries. It's everywhere. You're anti-academic if you don't believe it. And so we shy away because the devil's clever. We call the conference Reclaim, Overcoming the War on Women for the Glory of God. And if you looked at the title of my presentation, sounds pretty radical, but I'm actually stating that what you believe about the six days of creation is connected to the war on women. Now, that sounds so radical. How could that be? Oh, well, I want to show you that. You see, let's look at various aspects of the war on women. First of all, we can see the war in the culture itself in a big way. Just some of the headlines from recent times. Biden admin agencies refuse to answer what is a woman. Uh, nearly 30% of Generation Z women identify as LGBTQ. Uh, Biden admin threatens to take away lunch money for kids if schools don't allow boys and girls restrooms. Christian doctor fired for not using uh, the transgender pronouns. Uh, Christian doctor uh, for 17 years experiences uh, problems being sued. Sues a hospital because they sacked her, fired her because uh, that's English or Australian terminology, sacking. Um, and that was to do with transgender pronouns as well. Uh, this is a UK lawyer, uh, lawyer who was sued uh, for stating things that are factual about women. Uh, college professor uh, promoting pedophilia. We're seeing pedophilia raise its ugly head more and more. Uh, abortion pills can now be offered by retail pharmacies. Uh, drag queen story hour slammed as sexualizing children. Uh, and this was uh, at uh, a library in Maryland. Oklahoma State University, controversy on cam uh, or controversy, I forget which is American and Australian now, but anyway, whatever it is, on the campus after they host a drag queen story hour for kids, uh, preschool teacher and polyamorous gender fluid witch toes viral, uh, or goes viral, it should be, goes viral for admitting how she teaches her young students about sexuality and identity. Who would ever think we'd see headlines like that? And then uh, Seattle Museum, co-founded by Microsoft Executive, announces Drag Queen Summer Camp for Kids. California Assembly Committee passes bill that would legalize infanticide. US abortions reach highest level in over a decade. Documents show Planned Parenthood agreed to swap baby parts for intellectual property rights. And of course, just recently, where the transgender day fell on uh, Easter Sunday, and so the White House made this great proclamation about it. And uh, not only did President Biden, although I don't think he wrote it anyway, but not, uh, not only did he celebrate uh, Transgender uh, Day, but also celebrated the fact that he's redefined marriage as well in that same proclamation. Wow. There is a war in our culture, that's for sure. The, the war, really, we've got to think about it in this term. Yeah, there's a war on women, but it's actually ultimately a war on God. That's what it really is. And of course, Ephesians 6 reminds us, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the evil one. And you know, we can see the war in the culture, but actually what I'm more concerned about is the war in the church. Because, you know, often we look at the culture and we say, look how bad the culture is, and we're saying, you know, these terrible things in the culture, but actually, it's actually a reflection of the state of the church. Because, you know, in the church, we've had a generational loss. We're down to 9% Generation Z, church attendance. And the church has not, I believe, stood on God's word as they should have, have not raised up generations or helped parents to raise up generations that are godly. And now uh, we see the reflection of that in the culture. And this war you see in the church in, in a way that who would have ever dreamed would see this. Drag queen gives sermon to children at Chicago Lutheran Church. Azusa Pacific drops van on same-sex student relationships. LGBTQIA plus overture stirs debate in the Presbyterian Church. Congo, that was Presbyterian USA. Uh, congregations leave United Methodist Church over defiance of LGBTQ bans. Uh, fallout over LGBT spouses at Calvin University captures broader evangelical divide. Most of our Christian colleges are going woke or already there. Most of them. And many of them, perhaps you've sent some of your students there. And many wonder why when they go to these sorts of colleges, they end up 
walking away from the church. Um, this one, when the Harvard of Christian schools talking about Wheaton College in Illinois, which <laughs> certainly would not stand anywhere near where Answers in Genesis stands in regards to Genesis. In fact, is helping to infect other colleges not to believe Genesis. Um, so it goes woke. And then the Salvation Army, donors withdraw support in response to racial wokeness, but it's not just racial wokeness. The LGBTQ worldview has infiltrated uh, the Salvation Army hierarchy as well. And Campus Crusade, uh, now CRU, as articles about it just recently, fired two of its employees after they voiced concerns about the group's stance on LGBT issues. They're becoming woke as well. Evangelical Christian Publishing Association, which has published many books, even from conservatives, actually. Now, uh, of course, the woke aspects of the DEI courses and so on. Grand Canyon University uh, reverses their discriminatory, what they call discriminatory, LGBT policy. Uh, and here's an article in uh, Christianity Today discussing should uh, Christians be grappling, you know, what do they do with the pronoun issue. I even noticed that a lot of young girls in the church, even, even though they don't identify as transgender or anything, or LGBT, but they're actually putting pronouns on their Facebook profiles and things like that. And it might be he, sh uh, m sorry, might be she, her, you know, or female pronouns, but aren't they really placating the LGBT movement? Aren't they really, in a way, endorsing that? And yet our churches are allowing that. And then a new Barnard poll shows massive percentage of young people identify as all colors of the sexual rainbow, including those who claim to follow Christ. And we look at all this and we say, how did we get to this situation in America? How did we get there in our whole Western world? When did this war begin? Well, the Bible tells us when it began. It began 6,000 years ago, approximately, in a garden. When God created everything, it was very good. There was no violence. There was no sexual perversion. Uh, there was nothing like that. But what did God do? When he made the first man and woman, he gave the first man a very strict instruction. You can eat of all the trees, one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely die. In other words, Adam, you obey God's word. God is the authority. He's the absolute authority. He created you. He owns you. He sets the rules. Obey God's word. But what happened? Along came the devil in the form of a serpent who said, did God actually say? And he came to the woman first and to create doubt so that doubt would lead to unbelief. And I want you to notice something. The first attack was on the authority of the word of God. The devil's way of operating is to get you to doubt the Word of God. It's an attack on the Word of God, and then you will be like God. You be your own God. You decide truth for yourself. We sinned in Adam. We live in a fallen world. We're all sinners. The Bible makes that very clear. And because we go back to Adam, our sin nature is really summed up by Genesis 3, 1 and Genesis 3, 5. Our propensity, which we should be very, very cognizant of and make sure that we think about this daily, our heart is we would rather believe the word of man than the word of God. We don't want to believe God's word. That's our nature. We really don't want to believe God's word. And secondly, we want to decide truth for ourselves. We want to say, well, I think this. My opinion is this, rather than what does God's word say? We would rather trust man's word. And so a battle began between two religions. You know, at the Creation Museum, we make it very clear to people that ultimately there's only two foundations for our thinking. There's only two foundations for our worldview. Many people don't even know what worldview is. Worldview is your way of thinking, the way of understanding the world. And we don't pull our worldview out of the air. It comes from a foundation. And your foundation is either God's word or man's word. It's actually two religions because your worldview is really your religion. And so don't get the idea there are uh, non-religious people. You know, we see these statistics today, the number of people that identify as nuns having no religion. No, they have a religion. Their religion is there's no God, and they can be their own God. That's what their religion is. Everyone has a worldview. And we've got to understand the implications of these two foundations. The implication of building your thinking on man's word. Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel, everyone did what is right in his own eyes. In other words, when there's no absolute authority, when you've dethroned the absolute authority, when you've said God is not the absolute authority, I am, then who determines right and wrong? You do. Who determines what's good and what's bad? You do. Your feelings, you determine that. Who determines your identity? You do. 
And so a battle began, and this is how it's manifesting itself today. The battle we're seeing today has been there, it's just it's manifesting itself in ways we haven't seen before. And so there's this battle between God's Word and man's Word, and the secular worldview that's built on man's Word, the Christian worldview built on God's Word, and what comes out of that secular worldview? Moral relativism. And you see, you've got to understand something. These are symptoms of this, right? In other words, these are not the problems, they're the symptoms. This is the problem down here. And you start here, you have a whole different worldview and the absolutes of Christianity. And you start to realize something, if you want to change people from this worldview here, we can't do it by battling here. The battle is actually down here. Because until they believe God's Word and trust God's Word and trust Christ for salvation and realize they need to judge their feelings and behavior and everything they think against God's Word and build their thinking on God's Word, they're never going to change up here. And the trouble is, for many of us in the culture, and I find for many churches, they think the battle's here. And this is, too, what creates, in a way, the idea of hate speech. Because when you come against uh, the other worldview, if you don't do it the right way, they look on it as hate speech or you're intolerant. And one of the things I've always tried to explain to people, the reason that I believe what I believe is because I start here. If you don't have that starting point and you have this one, you're going to have a whole different worldview. We're never going to resolve our differences up here if we don't resolve it down here. And that's a really important point, and that affects how we witness, it affects how we talk to people, it affects how we write about this issue, it affects everything. But unfortunately, most of our churches aren't teaching that. And I want us to understand how that war manifests itself today because, you see, we're warned about that in Scripture. Because in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, and this is God's Word, has a warning for us. I want to warn you, and I'll paraphrase it, that the devil is going to use the same method he used on Eve on us. He's going to use the same method. Do you know what we should be saying? I need to understand that method. I need to know how it manifests itself today. I need to know how to deal with this because I want to make sure that we raise up our children ready for that method so they, they don't succumb. I need to make sure that my church, my congregation, my Sunday school class, my youth group, my, my Bible class, I want to make sure that they're ready for this method so they're not going to succumb. But unfortunately, I would say the majority of our churches have not done that and the majority of our families have not done that. And what was the method that was used on Eve? to create doubt in regard to the Word of God. In other words, an attack on the Word of God. I call that attack in Genesis 3.1 the Genesis 3 attack. And how does the Genesis 3 attack manifest itself in this era that we live in, that I believe started in about the 1800s? You see, if you go back to the time of Peter and Paul, nobody asked them about carbon dating. Or if you go back to Martin Luther, nobody asked him about dinosaurs. The word dinosaur wasn't even invented until 1841. But what is interesting is that as I've traveled around the world for the past 40 years, doesn't matter what country, it can be a third world country, I find people ask the same basic type questions when they know you want about the Bible, Christianity, God, Jesus. And those questions go like this. Well, don't we live in a scientific age? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? How do you know the Bible is true? What evidence is there for God who made God? Do you believe in Adam and Eve? Where did Cain get his wife? How did all the races come about? If there are only two people to start with, where's the evidence of the flood? Don't fossil layers prove millions of years in evolution? We know man evolved from ape-like creatures. How could the story of Adam and Eve be true? How can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering in the world? Didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago and evolve into birds? How could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? Hasn't science proved evolution true? Isn't the Bible an outdated book of mythology? Just for interest, put your hands up if you've heard those sorts of questions. Did you see all the hands? We're all familiar with those because they're all a part of the Genesis 3 type of quest, attack questions today. But I wonder what would happen if I said, how many of your churches are teaching the answers to those? How many are equipping our kids in our Sunday schools and youth groups and Bible studies? And how many are getting it from the pulpit? There are some, but they're a minority because most aren't. And people ask just some of the questions. And you'll notice something? They all have to do with attacking the Bible as a true book of history. And they're pretty well focused, a lot of them, on Genesis 1 to 11. Because as we're going to learn, do you realize Genesis 1 to 11 is the history that's foundational to everything? If that's true, we've got a problem because most of our churches don't teach that. And when did this attack in our time begin? 
Well, it began in the 1800s when there were atheists and deists who rejected God's word. He said, we don't believe in the flood of Noah's day. How did all the layers with all the fossils get here? They said, we believe they were laid down slowly over millions of years. Do you realize that's where the idea of millions of years came from in our modern era? It came out of atheism primarily, out of what's called naturalism. In other words, no supernatural involved. But do you know a sad thing that happened in the church? And I don't want you to get me wrong here. There have been great men of God who preached the gospel, seen people saved in their ministry, but in many ways, many of them, and mostly unwittingly, unlocked a door to undermine biblical authority to leave to the destructive influences we have today. You see, a man called Thomas Chalmers, a great man of God, back in the 1800s, founder of the Free Church of Scotland, said, you know what, we can believe in the millions of years, we'll just put in a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, and out of that came the popularization of the gap theory. Who's heard of the gap theory? Oh, yeah, it's permeated our churches. You know what the gap theory is? It's an attempt to fit man's belief of millions of years based on atheism into the Bible. Does anyone see a problem with that? And others said, oh, we'll reinterpret the days of creation, the day-age theory. And others had all sorts of creative ways of trying to fit the millions of years into the Bible. And by the way, if you're going to try to fit millions of years in the Bible, you know you can't do it from Adam onwards. Because those genealogies talk about when someone was born and when they died. You can't fit millions of years in there. That's why, if you're going to try to fit millions of years in the Bible, it has to be somewhere in those six days, Genesis 1-1, through those six days, somewhere in there, which is really the ultimate reason why most of our people in our churches don't believe in six days. And most of our clergy don't. But we'll come back to that. And then along come a man called Charles Darwin, who popularized the idea that life arose from matter and over, one, over millions of years, one kind of animal into another, ape-like creatures into people until we're sitting in an auditorium in Kentucky. And there were, there were theologians, particularly in England, who said, oh, well, we'll just say God used evolution. So dust to Adam represents ape-like creature to, 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 to man. I don't know what rib to Eve meant, but anyway, you can think about that. And others came along and said, oh, the Big Bang, oh, it's being popularized. You know what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We could say that's the Big Bang. Many clergy, many pastors say, you can believe in the Big Bang because God creating, that's the Big Bang. No, it's not. Wait a minute. The Big Bang is based on naturalism, atheism, to try to explain the universe without God. And that model has the stars coming before the sun that comes before the earth that's a hot molten blob for millions of years before it gets water. The Bible says God created the earth first covered with water. Sun, moon, and stars on day four. If you're going to add the Big Bang to the Bible, you're going to say God got it wrong. And so what arose in the church were all these different positions. These are just some of them. Gap theory, day age, theistic evolution, day gap day, framework hypothesis, progressive creation. There's a whole lot of them. And there's new creative ones that come up every year. Try, and they all have one thing in common, trying to fit millions of years into the Bible. And when you do that, you are reinterpreting the text in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. And it's really a direct attack on those first 11 chapters and people, this is a major issue because Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. There's nothing Genesis 1 to 11 is not the foundation for. It's a foundation for everything. And so part of the war on women is the war on Genesis 1 to 11 because Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for gender. It's the foundation for marriage. It's the foundation for the sanctity of life. It's the foundation for why we wear clothes. It's the foundation for the gospel. It's the foundation for the roles for men and women because of the way God created them. It's the foundation for everything. An attack on Genesis 1 to 11 is part of the war on women. And you see, I mentioned that if you're going to add millions of years into the Bible, you have to do something in, the, in those first six days. And herein is a major issue, because most of the people in our churches say six days doesn't matter, we're not sure, most of our ministers say that, just for interest. I'm not asking you what you believe, but to, to put your hands up if you've heard someone say, we don't know what to believe about the six days, or they're not six days, or you've heard a pastor say something like that, put your hands up if you've heard that. Oh yeah, of course we have. 
And many people will say, look, does it really matter what you believe about six days? What's that got to do with fighting abortion? What's that got to do with fighting transgender? Let me ask you a question. Does it really matter if we take God at his word? Do you hear people saying, it doesn't matter whether Jesus walked on water or not. It, it, it doesn't matter whether he really raised Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead. But you certainly hear them saying, it doesn't matter if you believe in six days or you believe Adam came from dust or, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe there. Why is it that we're, we're concerned about, about, you know, when it comes to Genesis, it doesn't really matter. Anywhere else in the Bible, oh, it matters. What, why the difference? Because I believe the devil knows if you get rid of Genesis 1 to 11, you have lost the foundation for everything. And then ultimately, anything goes. You see, every word of God is pure. Don't add to his words. Now, I want to make a point that's very important, just so you understand. I'm not saying it's a salvation issue, right? The Bible doesn't say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead and believe in a young earth in six literal days, you'll be saved. It doesn't say that. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Salvation is conditioned upon faith in Christ, not what you believe about the days of creation or the age of the earth. And then people say to me, oh, well, it doesn't matter then. Yes, it does matter because it's an authority issue. This is what I want us to understand. Why have we gotten to where we are in the church, in our nation? in the Western world. Why have we gotten to where we are, where the culture is at? You've got to stand back and understand it's an authority issue. Is God the authority or is man the authority? And there's been an incredible attack on God being the authority. It's an attack on his word. And it started in Genesis 1 to 11 in our time. And it's been very successful. And many of our uh, churches, our clergy, our Christian college academics, the majority of them have succumbed to the attack because of the, the intimidation from the world. And you'll be accused of being anti-intellectual, anti-science, anti-academic. If you believe like answers in Genesis in six literal days, and we abandon Genesis 1 to 11, so we don't really know or reinterpret it and we have lost the foundation for marriage, the foundation for gender, the foundation for everything. People, this is a serious issue and the church needs to repent of this compromise. You know, I've had a lot of media when they come to the Creation Museum or the Ark Encounter, you know, and it could be to report on a new exhibit or something or to ask us about the economic impact of the Ark Museum. It doesn't matter what the topic is. They always have these couple of lines they paste into every article. Today we interviewed Ken Ham. He's that Christian fundamentalist that believes in six days and rejects millions of years and rejects science. They just paste it into every article. And they usually ask me, you know, why, why do you take such a stand on six days and against millions of years? Isn't it obvious the layers were laid down over millions of years? Why, why do they get so emotional about the millions of years? And they always are, are attacking that aspect. That's the thing they do over and over again. I'll tell you why. Without millions of years, they can't postulate evolution. Because if you don't have millions of years and the universe only thousands of years, what are you going to do? Believe the Bible? It's interesting, back in 1954, George Wald, an American biochemist who received the Nobel Prize, said this, time is in fact the hero of the plot. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, the probable virtually certain. One only has to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. Look, it is impossible for matter to give rise to life. DNA, the molecule of heredity, is a complex information system with a complex language that could never come from matter by itself. Information can't come by itself. Languages can't come from matter by themselves. How do you convince people of an impossible process? You have to convince them of, a, of an incomprehensible amount of time. Without the time, they can't postulate their ideas. And we make no apology at the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter Answers in Genesis. We take a strong stand, a bold stand on the fact, oh, the universe is only a few thousand years old. Now, people will say to me, there's no label on the earth. The astronauts didn't see that when they were up there. 
That's true. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the universe is 6,000 years old. No, it doesn't. And, I'm <laughs> and if it did, we'd have a problem. You know why? Because God's written word was completed 2,000 years ago. So if it was 6,000 years, now it'll be 8,000 years. But do you know what God does? He gives us a very detailed history. And he tells us when Adam was made and he had a son, Seth, and, and it goes on and gives us these genealogies. And I'm going to say to you, if those days are ordinary days, now let's just assume they are for the moment. We'll come back to that. If those days are ordinary days and God created everything in six days and he created Adam on day six, and then you read through Scripture... Adam had a son, Seth, at 130, he fathered Enosh at 105, and he fathered Kenan uh, at 90, and uh, then uh, he fathered a son at 70, who fathered Jared at 65, uh, he fathered Enoch at 162, Enoch fathered Methuselah at 65, who fathered Lamech at 187, who fathered Noah at 182, and then he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth at around 500, and then you come to the time of Abraham, you come to the time of Christ, you come up to the present, and oh, it adds up to about 6,000 years. That's where I get the 6,000 years from. That's why I believe in 6,000 years, right? It's a consequence of the way I take God's Word, but that depends on those days being ordinary days, and that's the big question, isn't it? People say, oh, we don't know they're ordinary days. So the word day... In Hebrew, the word yom, what does it mean? I've had pastors say to me, well, the word yom can mean something other than an ordinary day. And my answer is, of course it can, but it can also mean an ordinary day. And they say, but it can mean something other than an ordinary day. So what? It also means an ordinary day. It's not a matter of it can mean this or that. It's a matter of what does it mean in the context of which it's used. And by the way, the word day mainly does use, mean day which I'm sure is a shock to us. Do you realize most words have two or more meanings dependent upon context? For instance, if I said to you, some of you are back after the last conference, you're sitting at the back, you're sitting with your back against the back of the chair, and you have a sore back. There's the word back that has different meanings. Did you get them all? Why? Context, right? Well, it's the same with the word day. If you said, back in my father's day, that means back at that time, the word day there means time, it took 10 days. Well, if you're driving from California to Kentucky, you might say it took me three days, unless you had an electric vehicle, then it took you 20 days uh, to get here. <laughs> but you know what that means, right? You know what the word day means. And then to drive across the Australian outback during the day, well, we use that, we say during the day, we, we do this. You mean the daylight portion of a day. Here's my, my point. The English word day has a range of meanings. It depends on context. The Hebrew word day has a range of meanings depending upon context. In Isaiah, Isaiah, translation, the day of the Lord, the time of the Lord, judges, the time, the day, the time of the captivity of the land. Now, a lot of people will point, theologians will point to Genesis 2, 4, and they say, if you're saying the days of creation are ordinary days in Genesis 1, but in Genesis 2, 4, it doesn't mean an ordinary day, it means time. Yeah, because it doesn't have the context to mean an ordinary day. You see, the word day is used 2,301 times in the Old Testament. And you know what's interesting? We know what it means everywhere except Genesis 1. <laughs> Where do we question the word day anywhere else in the Old Testament? I mean, we don't say, how long did Joshua take the march around Jericho? Was it a million years? Was it a hundred? We don't do that. We need to be asking ourselves a question. When does the word yom mean an ordinary day? Now, if you look up a Hebrew dictionary, a lexicon, the Brown Driver Briggs is one of the main ones used in our colleges, and it lists the, the examples of when day means an ordinary day, and it's all six days of creation. And then if you look up this more modern dictionary, Kola Bongartner, it actually has a heading that says, day of 24 hours, the first example, Genesis 1-5, the first day of creation. Now, why is that? Because here's what you find. 
Whenever the word day is used with a number, 410 times in the Old Testament, outside of Genesis 1, just ignore Genesis 1. Anywhere else where it's used with a number, it means an ordinary day. Whenever you have the phrase evening and morning, it means an ordinary day. Whenever you have the word evening with the word day or the word morning with the word day, it always means an ordinary day. And whenever you have the word night with the word day, it always means an ordinary day. So, because we know when day means an ordinary day, number with it, or the phrase evening and morning, or evening with day, or morning with day, or night with day. It must be pretty hard to work out what the days are in Genesis 1 because most people don't seem to know what they mean. Let's see how hard it is. And there was evening and morning the first day, evening, morning, day, evening, morning, number day, evening, morning, number day. Even. Look, it's almost like God is saying, these people in the 21st century are going to be so thick I'm not just going to use number to qualify it, I'm going to use morning and I'm going to use evening and on the first day I'm going to use the word night as well and they still won't get it because they don't want to believe my word. And by the way, this is the ESV, I don't really like the translation here at all because it doesn't say first day, the correct translation for the first day is one day. It's actually defining the word one, uh, defining the word day. It's one day. This is what a day is. Now, where do we get the idea of our week? The day, the earth's rotation, the month, the earth and the moon, the year, the earth and the sun, the week, the Bible. Genesis 1. God made everything in six days and rested on the seventh. It's the basis of the fourth commandment. And then people say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. How can you have day and night before the sun? If you take Genesis literally then the sun wasn't made till day four. So, the Bible says it was to be the light bearer from that time onwards for the day that already existed. And then people say, but, but you didn't have sun for the first three days. Let me think. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was our form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, let there be, and he divided the light from thee, and there was evening and morning one, Oh, there was light before the sun. And then people say, where did it come from? I don't know. <laughs> well, why didn't God tell us? Think about that stupid question. <laughs> Sorry about that, but... If God told us everything, we'd have an infinite number of books and we'd never get through them. He's not going to tell us everything. Do you think God is powerful enough to make light on day one and it's the whole electromagnetic spectrum? He doesn't tell us where it came from. He doesn't tell us how he did it, but he says there was and there was evening and morning, so either the earth's rotating or the light's rotating, one or the other. And then he said the sun was to be the light bearer from day four onwards. Do you think an infinite God can do that? Well, why don't we believe it? And then those that say you can add the Big Bang to the Bible. No, you can't. You can't add the Big Bang to the Bible, as I said earlier. You can't do that. And then I get these people, I hope you're not one of them. <laughs> they come up to me in churches and they ask me this question and that's in my mind where I say, good grief. Oh, not this question again. I don't say that out loud. I don't even look like I'm saying, I just think it. Just remember that when you ask me questions. I think things I don't say. <laughs> and they come up to me and they say, but the Bible says a day is like a thousand years. Oh. <laughs> so I very nicely say to them, and the rest of the verse says a thousand years are like a day. That just cancels that right out. <laughs> you're going to believe the first bit or are you going to believe the second bit? <laughs> and besides which, you can't use a phrase from the New Testament to determine the meaning of a Hebrew word in Genesis. That is not on. A Hebrew word depends upon the Hebrew language. And what's the context of 2 Peter 3? The second coming. And scoffers saying, he hasn't come back. He's not going to come. 2,000 years is a long time. No, to God a day is like 1,000 years or 1,000 years like a day. He's outside of time. You think it's a long time. God doesn't. That's the context, that's what it means. I can't believe how, what word will I use? Ridiculous people are. <laughs> and, and then I noticed something else. They only do that to question the days of creation. 
You don't ever hear it being used for any other day like, I think Jonah was in that fish 3,000 years. Day is like a 1,000 years. I mean, after all. <laughs> oh, no, it's why is it the days of creation? Because we'll do anything but believe in six literal days. Because we've been so intimidated, so indoctrinated by the world. Millions of years is everywhere. It's all the documentaries. It's in the museums. It's in the books. It's in the libraries. It's everywhere. You're anti-academic if you don't believe it. And so we shy away because the devil's clever. You know, there was a founding, one of the church fathers called Augustine. And he, could, he, he, he wasn't a Hebrew scholar either, but he didn't believe in six days because he said a powerful God wouldn't need six days. He believed he did it in one day. The Bible doesn't say one day. It says six days. And I love what the reformer Martin Luther said. He said, when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, let this period continue to have been six days. Do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> when are we going to learn as human beings we know nothing compared to God and we need to believe what He tells us instead of us forcing our opinions on God's Word? <laughs> I want you to understand something. The war on women is a war on biblical authority. Because you see, if you can destroy the authority of the Word of God, then you have no foundation for male and female, for gender, for marriage, for roles in marriage, for the family. It's all gone. But let me show you more how this happens in the church. Now, I could give you many, many examples. I'm only going to give you a couple. And, just, and this is a, a, a fairly recent one. There's a pastor, theologian called Gavin Ortland. Some of you might have heard of him. Um, and he came out with two videos against the position Ken Ham had. You know, people often ask me, what position do you take on Genesis? The biblical one. <laughs> and I want you to listen to what he said. I'm going to disagree with Ken Ham on creation here, but I offer this in a spirit of sincerely hoping this is helpful for people in the church today thinking about these topics. Recently, Ken Ham was on Ali Beth Stuckey's show, Relatable, and he was talking about young earth creationism, which is the idea that the days of Genesis 1 are 24-hour periods of time, the earth and the universe are very young, and so forth. And then he um, puts up a quote I made. To take a characteristic quote from one of his pamphlets, you can see how he sets the stakes here with regard to the age of the earth. Yeah, I said, what is the stake is nothing less than the authority of Scripture, the character of God. You know why the character of God? If you believe in millions of years, death and disease that you see in the fossil record has been here for millions of years. If God used millions of years, God's responsible for death and disease and suffering. The Bible says it's our sin that's responsible. And so... You know, this is very important and very foundation of the gospel and so on. So, he goes on. They're starting outside of Scripture with man's ideas and then bringing that to Scripture. That unlocks a door. So you hear there, he's explicitly denying that the age of the earth is a matter of theological triage, which is where we rank doctrines like baptism or speaking in tongues. Uh, he's saying it's different. And the rationale is an openness to an older earth is the result of an external influence, not the text of Scripture, whereas those issues, it's Christians arguing on the basis of Scripture for their views. That's the claim I want to argue against in this video, and I want to show basically, no, it is the text that is causing Christians to interpret this passage differently. So the context was, I actually said on the early Beth Stuckey show, I said, you know, when, when Christians argue about uh, baptism, eschatology, uh, you know, speaking in tongues, those sorts of issues, primarily they're arguing from Scripture, where the Bible says this here. Well, over here it says this. Yeah, but here it says this. Yeah, but here it says this. But in Genesis, when they're arguing about the days of creation, they say, but the earth is billions of years old. They're starting outside of Scripture. And he said, no, 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 we're not. We're not starting outside of Scripture at all. Remember what I said? If you're going to fit millions of years into the Scripture, you have to do it before Adam. I really don't think the world is six or eight or 10,000 years old. I really don't. But I believe God's the creator. So right now he's telling you, I don't believe in a young earth. And then I'll just show you a, a, a short bit of this video, a tiny bit. 
too a little bit because I want to talk about the strength of the evidence for an older universe. It's very strong. There's an abundance of evidence in creation for an older world. And so he then goes on in the rest of this video to say, here's all the evidence for millions of years. Here's all the evidence for an old universe. People, he already believes in an old universe. He already believes in billions of years. He can't believe in six literal days like we do. He can't believe in a young earth. He's not getting his, his um, reinterpretation of Genesis from the text. He's starting outside of Scripture. And by the way, that's true of Augustine. When it comes to the light, how could there be light before the sun? Wait a minute. He's questioning God's Word. And so, Ortland loves Augustine, and he quotes him. The issue that he's wrestling with, probably first and foremost, is where do you get the light before day four? He's really saying that's in the text. It's not an imposition onto the text. It's right there in the text, and he's saying, how do I understand that? Where does the light come from? If I'm trying to picture it in my mind, where is this light coming from? If the light is traveling this way or that way, where did it originate from? Total, there's some answers to that, but that's a totally valid question and a question generated from the text. And so uh, you can hear how in, in his own words he's struggling with this. No, it's not generated from the text. The text makes it clear. There was light before the sun. What's the question? This is God's Word. Do we say, how on earth did Jesus restore Lazarus's DNA and the memory in his brain and his muscles? If I don't use my muscles for a while, I have a hard time walking, and he was dead and for four days, and then he started walking. How did Jesus do that? Uh, something wrong here. <laughs> People, do you see what's happening? You know what? I mentioned Job. You know, when Job was going to argue with God that basically, you know, I didn't deserve any of this. I, I was a, a good person, basically. We know what went on behind the scenes. But then God says, Job, listen to me, Job. Where were you when I did this? Who determined this? Who shut uh, this? Uh, have you commanded? Have you entered? Have you comprehended? Who has cleft? From whose womb? Can you bind? Do you know? Can you? And as you go through 38, 39, 40, 41, and then you get to 42. And Job answered and said, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Wow. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I, here and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard of you but the, with the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Lord, I now see who you are. You know everything. You can do all things. I know nothing compared to you. I need to repent. I need to believe you. I need to trust you. I need to trust your word. That's where we all need to be. That's where all of our clergy need to be. That's where all of our Christian academics need to be. Instead of bowing to the academia of our age and, and with intellectual pride uh, th that we have and that academic pride, we need to bow to the God of creation and say, it's your word that's true. Even if I don't understand something, I, I will never understand everything because I'm a created finite being. How dare I question God? And you know the sad thing? This reinterpretation of God's Word and rejection of Genesis has permeated our Christian colleges. Wheaton is called the Harvard of Christian colleges. And I would say, ultimately, it's destructive to Christianity because all of our compromising colleges are ultimately because they undermine the authority of the Word of God. Uh, they were funded by a very liberal foundation to produce a textbook which they've been trying to get into Christian colleges to infect, I would say, Christian colleges around America and other parts of the world. And this was written by five of the Wheaton professors. Here's a statement from the textbook. A Bible-first approach devalues the meaninglessness, the meaningfulness of creation revelation. I got news for you. Here in Answers in Genesis, the Ark, the Creation Museum, I want to warn all of you, we have a Bible-first approach because we take God's Word first, because He knows everything. They say the age of the earth is now, it's basically a fact. Billions of years is a fact. No, it's not a fact. That's their belief. 
They say, although some Christians have argued the fall disrupted some kind of original perfection, there's no evidence from the Bible making that a foregone conclusion. In other words, the fall didn't do anything. The death and bloodshed you see today and suffering and disease, that's gone on for millions of years. The fall didn't do that. And yet Romans 8 says the whole of creation groans because of our sin. The Bible makes it clear death, disease and suffering is a consequence of sin. The fall did do that. And if the fall didn't do what we see today, then no wonder our young people say, how can there be a loving God if that's what he uses? No, you've got to say, oh, wretched man that I am, look what my sin has done. Who can be to deliver me from this bondage of sin and, and death? And if death has always been here, and God said death is very good, why is death going to be thrown into a lake of fire, and why is death called an enemy in the New Testament? And why did Jesus conquer death? And why did he weep at Lazarus' tomb? They say there's none uh, that, that, that uh, here is, it is enough to say the geological data to support a flood of massive proportion is like lacking. There's no archaeological evidence that lends support to a flood. There's no evidence for the global flood. All you find are billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Humans are hominoid primates. That means they are apes. In the hominoid tribe, we're just a bit more intelligent than the apes. By the way, that's what the world is doing today, blurring man and animals, that we're just an animal. And they're making animals have dominion over man. Have you noticed that? No, the Bible says we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're made in the God's image. You know, and then you get pastors like Charles Stanley. And when religion and science conflict, at the end of the day, if you are an honest person, science must win. People, this infiltrates our churches. It infiltrates our colleges. There's an incredible attack on Genesis 1 to 11. There's a war against Genesis 1 to 11. It's part of the war on women because Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. And I want to make a statement. If you want to be woke proof, the key to being woke proof is believing the literal history of Genesis 1 to 11. And to show you this, I want to give you some examples. If you want to deal with any issue, it doesn't matter what the issue is, you have to start with Genesis 1 to 11. We have got to raise up generations in our churches and in our families to think foundationally starting from Genesis 1 to 11 and equipped with answers, apologetics. You see, think of the war on gender. How do you deal with gender? You start from Genesis 1 to 11. The Bible says God made man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female. There's only two options. Have you noticed that? Did you know what President Biden tweeted on Sunday, Easter Sunday? Here's what he tweeted. He says, today on Transgender Day of Visibility, I have a simple message to all trans Americans. I see you, you are made in the image of God and you're worthy of respect and dignity. I got news for you, President Biden. Had you quoted the whole verse, you would say, but there's only two genders. But he didn't quote the whole verse. He only quoted part of the verse. And by the way, if you believe what the Bible says, that doesn't mean you hate them. And he, you know what he was basically saying? On this day of visibility, we need to love transgender people. I got news for you. We need to love them 365 days of the year, not just one day of the year. And part of that love means sharing with them the truth of God's word about sin and about what God says who we are and what our identity is, not what they feel. You know, you can read about the rest of the script, Genesis 5, 2, male and female. Uh, Leviticus 15, 32, male or female. In fact, in the New Testament, when Jesus was asked about marriage, he said, haven't you read? And then he quotes the text of Genesis 1, 27. He made the male and female. There's Jesus, the son of God, the creator, saying there's two genders. He does it again in Mark 10. And you know what? Science confirms it. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and males have a pair of X, Y, Chromosomes, females have XX. Science confirms, oh, of course, you know, liberals don't believe in science. Because if you believed in science, there's two genders, right? Christians believe in science. And by the way, 
I know that there are some differences, three X's, two X's, what, they're a fraction of a fraction, a small fraction of a percent, it's not part of the created order, that's because we live in a sin-cursed universe and there are problems because of sin, you know, mutations and so on. And then we're told today, oh, your biological sex is one thing, but your gender is what you feel. So now they divided out gender from biological sex. How do we understand that? You've got to start from Genesis 1 to 11. We live in a fallen world. We have a sin nature. The whole of creation groans. We're warned in the Bible, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You can't trust your sin nature. You can't trust your feelings because of sin. And it's only a Christian that can understand that, which is why I said the solution to all these issues has to be God's Word, because until they understand who they are and that we understand our identity in Christ, they're not going to understand this. And too many of us are fighting up here instead of getting out there and proclaiming the truth of God's Word and the Gospel and defending the Christian faith and pointing them to the truth of who we are. We've allowed generations to be taught against the Bible, even in our churches that have said, you can believe what you're taught at school, you can believe in evolution, don't worry, Johnny, just trust in Jesus. No wonder we've lost them. You know, my parents taught us verses like this, I've stored up your word in my heart so I might not sin against you. Because they understood we need to judge our feelings, our behavior against the absolute authority of the word of God because you can't trust your feelings. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. You know, when God was warning Cain, who brought the wrong sacrifice, because there was a problem in his heart, actually, it was a heart problem was the issue, and God said to him, Cain, sin is crouching at the door, your sin nature, it wants to rule over you, it wants to master over you, don't let it do that, and he did, and he killed his brother Abel. Our sin nature wants to master over us every day which is why we've got to continually look to God and His Word and judge our actions and what we believe against God's Word. We need to do that every day. Why we need to be saturated in the Word of God. That's why we, we need to study God's Word to show us up with truths as, as workmen and being able to, uh, to understand truth and error and so on, rightly dividing the Word of God. And remember, we can overcome any temptation in Christ, no matter how hard that temptation is, no matter how strong it is. As Christians, we've got to look to Christ. But you see... The trouble is, most of our churches have pointed generations away from God's Word. You don't need to believe Genesis. You don't believe that. Believe what you're taught at school. Millions of years. That's okay. Just trust in Jesus. Then there's no foundation for marriage. No foundation for gender. Then it's whatever I decide. They've unlocked the door. And the next generation pushed that door wide open. What about the war on marriage? How do you deal with marriage? You have to start from Genesis 1 to 11. We read God made male and female. He made man from dust, not from an ape man. He said, it's not good that man should be alone. Why was man alone? No one else was made in the image of God. He brought the animals to Adam to name to see that. He named the animals. There was none made in the image of God. He didn't look at a female chimp and say, she's close enough, I'll date her. (laughs) So God put put him to sleep and from his side, not from an ape woman, but from man's rib, he made a woman. She came from man. And note, Adam was created first. Eve was created after Adam. And in the New Testament, Paul uses that as a basis for talking about roles for men and women. Because man was to have the headship role. He was the one given the instruction by God not to take the fruit. The woman wasn't. That's why man gets the blame for sin and not the woman. By one man, sin entered the world. Because he was to be the head. You know, sometimes I think, the Bible says he was with her when she took the fruit. I think he was looking and saying, I'll see what happens if she dies, then I'll know it's no good, you know. (laughs) Maybe God will make me another one then. (laughs) And then when you jump over to the New Testament, what do you see in 1 Corinthians 11? Twice, Paul says, woman came from man, attesting to the historicity of Genesis. And then we read this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Do you know what that is? The creation of marriage. And I got news for this nation. God created marriage, not Joe Biden or the Supreme Court justices. God did. Do you know what you notice? 
We notice today people who abandon God's word, and we notice that, you know, their foundation is man's word. Number one, read Romans 1, they worship the creature rather than the creator. Instead of man having dominion over the creation, the creation has dominion over man. You see that in the climate change religion. It is a religion, don't get sucked into it. It's an anti-God religion that says man can save himself and man will save the planet. And man's going to destroy the planet. No, God promised man will never destroy the planet. Read Genesis 8.22, while the earth remains, sea time and harvest, day and night, summer and winter will not cease. And um, I and one of our uh, young scientists, Jessica, have a book on climate change coming out. It's called Climate Change for Kids and Parents Too. <laughs> Nobody's ever written a book on climate change like this from a Christian worldview perspective. It'll be out in a week. It's incredible. Look on our website. Keep watch for it. But then we jump over to the New Testament. When Jesus was asked about marriage, not only did he quote the text of Genesis 1:27, male and female, he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they'll be one flesh. He's attesting to the historicity of Genesis that's foundational to marriage. And you think about it, we've had generations of kids, the majority of them, 90% of them, 85, 90% go through a public education system that is throwing God out, the Bible out, prayer out. You know, a lot of us think secular means neutral. So they don't have religion in the public schools. Load of nonsense. The Bible says you're for Christ or against, you walk in light or darkness, you gather or scatter, you build your house on the rock or the sand. There's no neutrality, there's no in-between. If the secular schools are not for Christ, they are what? Against. And if your kids are in, whatever reason, I, I know people have all sorts of reasons, there's all sorts of difficulties out there, I understand that, but we have got to understand what the secular worlds are. Instead of calling them public schools or secular schools, let's call them anti-God schools, because that's what they are. Change that terminology and start letting that sink in. And you see, if we've had generations, the majority of our pastors have endorsed the public education system. They've said to the generations, you can believe what you're taught about evolution. That doesn't matter. You don't need to believe Genesis. Trust in Jesus. The foundation they have is man's word. They don't have a foundation for marriage or gender from the Bible. So the LGBT movement can come in and capture them because they've got the foundation for that. And people, it's not just marriage. Ultimately, every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. You think about it. Where do we get sin from? Genesis 1 to 11. Death, Genesis 1 to 11. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is he called the last Adam? Takes the place of the first Adam. Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we wear clothes? God gave clothes because of sin. Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is marriage a man and a woman? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have dominion over the creation? Genesis 1 to 11. Do you think Genesis 1 to 11 is important? The trouble is we have generations today who've been taught against it, don't even know it, they don't even know what the Bible is, and without that foundation, how do you understand the New Testament? How do you understand the Gospel? How do you understand who Jesus is? How do you understand what sin is? How do you understand why Jesus died on the cross? How do you understand any of that? And we wonder why they don't respond? The war on women is also portrayed by the war on children and the family. You see, how do you deal with abortion? You start from Genesis 1 to 11. Abortion is a war on children. Abortion is nothing more than child sacrifice to the God of self. That's what it is. God created man in his image. The animals weren't created that way. Let the earth bring forth the living creatures. How did God make man? Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and then made after our likeness, they have dominion. Today, you notice, they redefine dominion. The creation has dominion over man, redefine marriage, redefine gender, redefine, they redefine everything God has done, because once man is his own God, he wants to be the one to define these things, and reject God's definitions. You know, when I was a teacher, I was told to teach the six kingdoms of life, and the animal kingdom had man in it, and here's a problem. More and more, our generations have been taught man's just an animal. You see, if you use a criterion made in the image of God, you'd have man in his own kingdom, the human kingdom, to help people understand we are special. Yes, we might have a body like a mammal's body, but we are special. We're different to the animals. We're made in the image of God. Jesus died for man. He didn't die for the animals. He became a man, a human being, not an animal. 
And you see at our Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit, we show how, you know, you get one set of DNA from the male, one from the female, uh, you get fertilization, make sure you see that exhibit, it's the most powerful pro-life exhibit in the world. At fertilization, you have a unique combination of information different to any other human being who's ever existed or will exist or does exist, different to the mother. It's unique. And as that cell develops into our body, no new information is added, which means you are 100% you made in the image of God right from fertilization. So abortion is killing a human being from 15 weeks? No, from fertilization. And by the way, <laughs> notice I say fertilization. I suggest you don't say from conception anymore because if you look at our fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit, the medical... Uh, community in their Sedman's Dictionary, in the later one, has redefined conception um, as implantation in the womb, and they've changed the definition. It used to be fertilization. It no longer is. Why have they changed the definition to allow for those abortion drugs to get rid of a fertilized egg? You've got to be, you've got to be aware of the changing definitions of words. And how did God look at it? You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Before I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, before your body was formed, it's you. Even when your substance was unformed, it's still you. And yet we have the Vice President of the United States out there shouting, my body, my rights. A woman has a right to do with her body what she wants. A fertilized egg is not part of a woman's body. It is separate. It's an individual. It's a human being made in the image of God. And if it's a male, a male, where did the Y chromosome come from? The woman's body? No. You know, when you have a kidney transplant, you have anti-rejection drugs because your body recognizes the foreign tissue. Did you know a fertilized egg is looked on by a woman's body as foreign tissue to reject that God inbuilt a complex, incredibly designed anti-rejection system to enable it to implant in the womb? Wow. And when you go through our exhibit, there's one more thing I want to say. At the end of that exhibit, we do remind people that God is a gracious, loving, forgiving God. And for those that have had abortions, hey, if you confess your sin, he will forgive your sin. We've got to remember, we can't get rid of consequences, but we can get rid of the guilt by confessing that to Christ. What a difference that makes. The war on women is a war on the family. Do you realize the family is the first and most fundamental of all human institutions God ordained in Scripture? It is. It is the educational unit that God uses to transfer that legacy from one generation to the next and to impact the world. The devil wants to get rid of that, wants to destroy it. It's the first and most fundamental. We see it exhibited in the war on parents. Who owns children? Well, look at this news headline. Biden claims school children don't belong to parents when they're in the classroom. Wrong. Children are inheritance from the Lord. The Lord ultimately owns them. And he's entrusted them to you as parents and instructs parents to train them. There are roles for men and women. There's a war on those roles. There's parental roles. I mean, the Bible makes it very clear. The fathers shall make known your children your faithfulness. Fathers, do not provoke your children in anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Things that we have heard and known from our fathers... Uh, and he established the testimony in Jacob. He commanded our fathers to teach their children. The next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and teach them to their children so they will not forget the works of God. Make sure you train your, your children. And fathers, don't be like the Israelite fathers who were stubborn, who didn't train their children. And you read after they crossed uh, the Jordan River, the next generation, the younger generation, rebelled against God. They lost it, even though God told them, build 12 stones as a memorial to remind your children. They forgot his works and the wonders he had shown them. One of the big problems we have today is most fathers in our church homes are not the spiritual head of their homes as God has commanded. And I know there are single parent families out there and you know, you, you have to do those things that, uh, that the Bible instructs regardless. I understand that because we live in a fallen world. That's where the church should be helping those people. But people, God created the family to have a spiritual head to be the priest to their wife, their family, to train their children. And fathers have that role, and most do not take it on. And a lot of women don't want them to take it on. And there's a reason for that. You know, the feminist movement has even infiltrated our churches. What about the issue of equality? Are men and e women equal? 
Well, they're equal in value before the Lord. They're equally made in the image of God. They equally can receive the free gift of salvation, but they don't have equal roles. God gave us different roles. And it's not a matter of our opinion. It's not a matter of saying, well, I think this, I think that. I get tired of people saying that. What does God's word say? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, a sacrificial love to be prepared to die for their, their, their wives. Their role, one of their roles is to pour out that love on the woman. Our churches need to be teaching this because I've had fathers come to me and say, I don't know how to be a father. I haven't been taught. I don't know how to be a husband. It's a massive problem in our churches. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Wow, the marriage relationship, Paul is using hence God's word to talk about the marriage relationship between Christ and the church and the roles of man and woman and and it all goes back to creation and Adam was created first and Eve was created from Adam and people, we could spend another day talking about all that. Are we prepared to accept the role God has given to me? We're to submit to each other in the roles God has given. But you see, we have a problem in a fallen world because sin distorts roles. And you know what's interesting? In Genesis 3.16, after the fall, so this is after the fall, after sin, God says to the woman, I'll surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. And you know, uh, the animal world doesn't really have this to, uh, to an extent, but humans do. Women have pain in childbirth, right? And it can be intense pain. And then there's a the pain of bringing up kids anyway. Uh, you understand that pain too, right? But notice it says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. See, I believe here, and I've read a lot of commentaries on this, that God is reminding them that man is to be the spiritual head. But in a fallen world, what happens? We want to redefine everything. And so I believe it's also a warning. In a fallen world, the woman will want to usurp the authority of the man, and the man will want to lord it over the woman despotically instead of loving her as he should. And you can see countries around the world where you see the, where men treat women. We have to be reminded, God gave us roles, but sin is going to distort those roles. Am I allowing sin to master over me in regard to my role? Well, that's a whole other topic, isn't it? You see, the war on women is a war against God's word. This is really what's going on in our culture. Two foundations, two worldviews, and this is what comes out of those worldviews, and we see this worldview clash. Right now, in America, in fact, the whole Western world, the secular worldview has become the dominant worldview, the Judeo-Christian worldview based on the Bible. That really is what the founding fathers permeated this nation with. This is now the minority worldview. Therefore, these on this side say, you people have hate speech, you are misogynist, you people are intolerant, uh, etc. How do we deal with that? Well, as I said earlier, we're going to have to understand, don't argue at this level, because ultimately the argument's down here. Now, you know, we incorporate things into dealing with this level, that's true. That's why we have the Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit and so on, but ultimately the argument's down here. Because, you know, the devil knows, how do you get rid of that foundation? How do you get rid of that structure, Christianity? And as I said, it starts from Genesis 1 to 11. You've got to attack the foundation. In other words, attack the word of God. But notice the devil knows attack the foundation. And he's successfully gotten much of the church to attack their own foundation. And then we look up here and say, we don't know how to deal with all these problems. They're not problems, they're symptoms. The problem is actually down here. And so, what's the solution? The solution is we need to be raising up generations with the right foundation, the right worldview who know what they believe and why, equipped with answers to defend the Christian faith, who know how to argue foundationally, because only then can we ultimately deal with those issues up here. In other words, we need to reclaim what? 
What do we need to reclaim for overcoming the war on women for the glory of God? We need to be reclaiming the authority of the word of God in our homes, in our churches, in everything we do. And I want to leave you with this challenge um, before I tell you a little about some of the resources. You know, we read in the Bible in Genesis chapter 26 that there were wells that had been dug in the days of Abraham, Isaac's father, and Isaac came and found those wells. And I want to use this because, you know, water in the Bible is symbolic of the gospel, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, it's symbolic of the Word of God. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give them, said Jesus, um, that I will gi give him will become a spring of water welling to eternal life. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. I would suggest to you that in America and the rest of the we rest of world, there used to be lots of wells. Wells giving forth the water of the word that permeated the nation. We read in Genesis that the Philistines had stopped and filled the earth, filled with earth all the wells that Isaac's father had his servants dig. And so the Philistines had filled up those wells. You know, the wells of water that used to be in this nation, in a way, today's Philistines, the secularists and compromising Christians actually, have filled up those wells. They filled them up with all the secular teaching they've indoctrinated generations in through the education system and the media and compromising churches. You know, in Jeremiah, we read this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they've trusted man's word, not God's word. And man's word doesn't hold that water. Only God's word does. And now we find that that water is scarce. It is scarce in this land. There's a famine in the land in the days of Amos. I'll send a famine on the land, a famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord. People, one of the most asked questions we get asked here at, at Answers in Genesis, Ark Encounter and Creation Museum, one that I get asked is, do you know a church in our area that takes the same stand you do? Because we can't find one. They're out there, but they're a minority. There's a famine in the land. Most churches are not teaching the foundation of Genesis as they should. Most are not teaching apologetics to defend the Christian faith. There's a famine in the land. Most of our Sunday school material doesn't do it. Most of our Bible study material doesn't do it. There's a famine in the land. And we see the results with the exodus from the church. You look back in the 1700s, 70, 80% of the population went to church. Now, in 2021, Generation Z is down to 9%. And we read that Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father. So he said, we need to redig these wells so the water will go forth. And by the way, when they dug the wells, they had opposition. When you're going to dig wells, you'll have opposition. They had to move to another area. Then they got opposition again. They had to move to another. But they eventually dug the wells. When you're on about the word of God and you stand as we should, you're going to get opposition. Expect it. In this world, there will be tribulation, there will be persecution, because we're on the narrow way, not the broad way. Be prepared to stand, not enough are prepared to stand. And so we read about the herdsmen who quarreled. No, the water is ours. Don't you, don't you have your water there? We want it, our water. So we get lots of attacks today. But you know what? What we're doing is our best to equip people in apologetics, with Bible apologetics, uh, to help people answer today's attacks, to proclaim God's word and the gospel so that we can spread the water and dig more wells. And people, we need to be out there digging wells. I, I urge you, I challenge you to be digging wells in your family, digging wells to how that water will flow in your churches and Sunday schools and in your Christian schools and in your home schools and if you're a politician in politics and whatever you're doing to be digging those wells to reclaim the authority of the Word of God. Well, what's the solution? 
It's always been God's word and the saving gospel. That's the solution to the war on women. That's the solution to what's happening in our culture. We need to be building the structure on the right foundation because the structure that is built on the wrong foundation collapses, which is what's happened in most of our churches and Christian colleges.